Thank you so much. What a kind introduction. Um, before I get started, I'd also like to give just a very, very hearty thank you to Dr. Nirja, who did an incredible job organizing my trip and making me feel so welcome. This is my first um, trip to India, and when uh, Dr. Um, Nirja and I met in Bangkok about three or four years ago, um, I was actually, I didn't realize it, but I was in the throes of a Giardia infection. <laughs> And I remember her saying, have you ever been to India? And I said, no. And she said, well, maybe you should come. And I said, I don't think I'm ever traveling again. <laughs> it was just, I felt so sick. But anyway, with the right antibiotics, I got over that. And then when the opportunity came up, it, <laughs> I took advantage of it. Um, we're waiting for the slides here. Um, oh, so while we're waiting for this, before I get started on my regular topic, I would like to um, point out that there is a flyer on the desk out front, and I'd like to invite all of you to come to the ISAP meeting. The International Scientific Association for Probiotics and Prebiotics is holding its first meeting in Asia in June of um, 2018, this coming up June, June um, 5th and 6th. And we're very excited about this opportunity, and we are hoping to welcome as many people interested in the probiotic and prebiotic field as possible from the Asian regions. We have a nice blend of topics that, that they kind of blend the East and West themes for probiotics and prebiotics. So there's a flyer out, out on the table. It does show the meeting website, which is um, isapp2018.org. And that, uh oh, just closed here. And that um, website will get you to the meeting web, I'm sorry, that URL will get you to the meeting website where you will see the registration, um, the, the bu a button for registration as well as a button for submitting an abstract. Our early bird registration um, offer is over at the end of February and abstracts for poster presentations are accepted through the end of February. So those dates are, are coming up soon. So I just encourage you to, to please join us there. We have top-notch science at these meetings as well as great networking opportunities. So I hope to be able to see at least some of you there. So the topic of my presentation today is the contribution of probiotics to health. And although I will spend some time talking about certain therapeutic functions of probiotics, I, I do want to try to bring the, the, the area of probiotics focused a little bit on the, the ability of probiotics to influence someone who, who's generally healthy. I know everyone in the room knows what a probiotic is, but I wanted to just review the few characteristics of a probiotic so that we're all starting out at the same, on the same page. So the definition of probiotics is live microorganisms that when administered in adequate amounts confer a health benefit on the host. So there's three aspects to that definition. The organism needs to be alive when administered. It has to be delivered at a level that's going to provide some benefit. And it also has to be studied and shown to have a beneficial effect. Now, microbes that are used as probiotics, of some of the more common genera are shown in this slide, lactobacillus, bifidobacterium, saccharomyces, enterococcus, and even bacillus. And there are many species of these particular genera that are used as probiotics. But I think an important point about the field as we're looking down the road is that as the research in the area of gut microbiota has expanded and as we've learned more about the microbes that are colonizing our body and some of which are associated with healthy people, I think that the range of microorganisms that will be used as probiotics in the future is going to expand. Now, whether or not these microorganisms are going to have to be used in a, in a drug capacity or whether or not they're going to be able to be used in foods and supplements remains to be seen. But I expect in five years, if I have this slide up, I will have more genera listed on this slide. Now, everyone here, I'm sure, also is aware of this, but not all probiotics can be considered to be the same. And I am a horse owner. In fact, the third slide of the horse jumping is my horse with my daughter on it. And, um, but I like using an example of an animal that have, in this particular case, horses that are of the genus and species Equus cabalus. 
And it's very clear from looking at the capabilities of the three different equines that are on this slide that each one of these horses brings different skills, different strengths to, um, to bear on their um, athletic ability. And really a similar way of thinking can be applied to probiotic strains. So the example I have on this slide is of Lactobacillus acidophilus NCFM. And um, the genus, of course, is Lactobacillus in this example. This species is Acidophilus, and the strain designation is NCFM. And, and the point I want to make here is that there are different strains of even the same species that may have different effects. And we just need to keep that in mind as we look at the body of literature on probiotics. Now I want to telescope back just a little bit and comment on, on gut microbiota research. It's very clear over the past 10 to 15 years, the number of studies and the, and the progress that's been made in understanding the nature of the microorganisms that colonize our body has really grown. I mean, the, the, the quantity of papers is enormous now and the, and the extended understanding of this field. But I think in terms of how this dovetails with the probiotic field is that global research that has occurred on human microbiome has really expanded our insights into the potential of probiotics. I think that the probiotic field has really benefited from the increased understanding we now have of the different mechanisms, for example, that, that our colonizing microbiota have to be able to interact with the host and also the types of physiological functions that, that these colonizing microorganisms bring to bear. And all of that has fed very nicely into the whole probiotic field. Now we do know that microbes associated with the human body are very important to health. And we know that the colonizing microbes have been shown to have a variety of physio physiological functions, and this has already been mentioned um, during the introduction, but they have an important role, for example, in food digestion, in immune system development, in endocrine function, energy homeostasis, fat storage, blood lipids, brain signaling, and gut integrity and function. So they have very broad-reaching physiological effects. However, people who have been studying the microbiota have come to the conclusion and, and offered the hypothesis that our modern microbiota, especially of modern humans in more industrialized settings, may be, in fact be deficient and may in fact not be optimal. And this has come from research that has compared the microbiota of hunter-gatherer tribes with the microbiota of modern people living in more urban industrialized settings and have shown that there's a big difference in terms of not only the composition but the diversity and, and other measures of, of microbiota as well. And the theory has been proposed that our deficient microbiota or our microbiota, as in this commentary by Dr. Blazer indicated or called it, is the theory of our disappearing microbes. So microbes that are no longer present in modern man but have, are still present in hunter-gatherers, for example, that, that the, these disappearing microbiota may in fact be related to the epidemics of chronic disease. And, and I think that this is an important concept going forward which, which, set, which sets the stage for the question about how we might be able to influence the microbiota um, for health. Now, our modern microbiota, I'm sorry, our modern life may negatively impact our microbiota in many ways. And I've got a few of these listed on this slide. So for example, the use of antibiotics and other drugs, including proton pump inhibitors and metformin and, and other common drugs uh, are known to affect the microbiota. C-section births have an impact on how the, the newborn infant is colonized, which have potential impacts down the road for the health of that infant. The re reduction of breastfeeding um, is also a factor in modern life where, where infants are not breastfed as often as they used to be and therefore are denied the, the microorganisms that we know now are associated with breast milk as well as the very rich um, concentrations of fructooligosaccharides that are present in breast milk that help feed the beneficial microbes that are associated with these infants. 
sanitation. Of course, this is a really important thing, but, but increased sanitation has meant that, that modern man is, is, a, is, has fewer opportunities to be exposed to the microbes in his environment. We also are living in a situation with, in, in modern um, societies where we have diets that typically have, are, have fewer live microbes in them and lower concentrations of fiber. And also reduced living around animals has decreased our exposure to microbes. And so these are examples of ways in which modern life is probably negatively impacting the development of the microbiota and the populations that are associated with us. And that has been leading to this idea that we're probably missing some important micro microbes that may be associated with health. Now we do know that the microbiota stabilizes at about two years of age. Um, but it can change, and it can change over time as we age. And importantly, it can also change in response to short or long-term perturbations. So these perturbations may include diet, but it also may include environmental exposures, antibiotics, drugs, probably stress. And it may change as we um, in, endure the challenges of different diseases. Now, many disorders and diseases have been associated with an altered microbiome, and we know this by studies that have compared the microbiota of healthy subjects to subjects that have the conditions that are listed on this slide. But very importantly, to date, we really don't have strong evidence in humans of causality. So we know that people with these disease states have an altered microbiota, but we don't know if the, micro, the altered microbiota is associated with, in any causal way with the development of the disease. In fact, the altered microbiota could be a consequence of the disease, or the altered microbiota could be a consequence of drugs that are being taken to treat the disease. So it's important to not jump to a conclusion that these altered mi microbial states lead to the disease, but certainly there's evidence in animal models that this may be the case. So this is a very active and very important area of research. So that's my telescoping back, commenting on the microbiota as a whole. So we know that our colonizing microbiota are important to our health. And the whole field of probiotics is really predica predicated on the question, can we influence the microbiota with diet and improve the microbial function or even correct dysfunction? And this question can only be answered by looking at the, the human trials that have been associated with probiotics to determine whether or not these effects have occurred. So the question has to do with the, what kinds of manipulation of diet could potentially be beneficial. And what I will, would like to mention in this slide is is what types of dietary strategies are known to support the gut microbiota. The four main ones that, that I would like to mention on, are on this slide include fibers, and we know that, for example, that dietary fiber increases overall microbial numbers and diversity. I'd also like to mention prebiotics, which are substances that are known to selectively increase the beneficial bacterial populations or activities in our gut. So we think of prebiotics as being substances that really can feed the, the beneficial bacteria that we already harbor. But I'm not going to spend much any, any additional time talking about fibers and prebiotics. I'm going to focus primarily on dietary strategies that include probiotics and fermented foods. Now, fermented foods, we, we, we know we have a very rich tradition of fermented foods in India. And um, thank you to Nirja for providing these examples of, of many of the fermented foods. And, and I've tried several of them already in the few days I've been here. The, what the foods on this slide have in common, besides all being um, indigenous to, to India, are that all of these fermented foods retain the live microbes that are used to, to produce the food. And that's a very important characteristic. Not all fermented foods necessarily retain the live microorganisms because they may be processed after fermentation and those microbes may either be killed or somehow um, separated away. So let's look at the comparing probiotics to fermented foods. Now, as I mentioned earlier, 
Probiotics must contain live microbes, they must be tested and shown to have health benefits, and they must deliver a level of live microbes that is shown to confer a benefit. So three very simple criteria. Now let's look at what we know typically about fermented foods. We know that they are made by live microorganisms, but as I mentioned, live microbes may not survive due to post-processing, um, uh, post-fermentation processing. Also importantly, fermented foods may not have been tested for their health benefits. So although fermented foods certainly be, can be considered to be healthy dietary components, they may not reach the bar to really be called a probiotic. When a fermented food contains live microbes at sufficient levels and is known to confer a health benefit, then it can legitimately called a probiotic are a probiotic food, but if it doesn't meet those criteria, then really it's a fermented food, but not necessarily a probiotic, but not a probiotic. But let's look at some examples of benefits that have been tested for fermented foods. So some fermented foods have undergone uh, research, have been studied in randomized controlled trials, or in some cases um, association studies. And this is just a summary slide that shows some of these areas that, pro, that, I'm sorry, that fermented foods have been studied. And they include some very interesting endpoints, such as indicators for, for diabetes, such as glucose tolerance. We know that yogurt is associated with improved digestion of lactose, um, weight management, blood lipids have been tested, bone mass density, muscle soreness, functional bowel syndrome, I'm, yeah, symptoms, as well as reducing infections or common infectious diseases. And I call your attention to this review by Maria Marco and her colleagues um, that was just published last year. It's a very nice review article in the area of fermented foods. But what this shows is that, yes, even though not all fermented foods have been tested and shown to have benefits, certainly some of them have. So let's move from fermented foods into the actual area of probiotics. So this slide shows a summary of benefits of probiotics. And what I've done on this slide is just put a box around a couple of examples of these benefits that I would consider to be more medical in nature or therapeutic in nature. So there's quite robust evidence in the area of probiotics and prevention of necrotizing enterocolitis. There's also studies looking at probiotics and the treatment um, of ulcerative colitis and pouchitis. So these are examples really of therapeutic uh, benefits. Now, the focus of my talk really is looking at probiotics for more of the general healthy population and the promotion of health, but I do want to take just a few minutes to cover a few studies that I think might be of interest to you in the area in, in therapeutic benefits. So this particular study, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this particular paper is an example of a uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. And as you know, the, the systematic review and meta-analysis process is embarked upon when, you wanna, when, when the researcher wants to understand what the totality of evidence about a particular area says. And so what they do is they identify criteria for doing a very systematic um, assessment, or assessment's the wrong word, they look very hard for all literature that, that um, pertains to the particular research question, and they want to make sure that they uncover all the available studies. And then once they pull together from the systematic review process, in some cases they can pull the information together if there's enough homogeneity in terms of how the, the studies have been conducted, and they will conduct a meta-analysis, which is they pull the results together and try to come up with an endpoint um, on the, uh, or a conclusion, I should say, on what the data can tell us about the research question. So this particular meta-analysis was conducted, um, and they conduct, as I mentioned, they conducted the systematic review and then the meta-analysis, and what they found in their systematic review was they uncovered 23 randomized controlled trials that focused on the question, which was, the, was looking at benefits of probiotics to preterm neonates. And this particular um, assessment was conducted and uh, was looked specifically for studies conducted in low-income and, and medium-income countries. 
what they found was 23 randomized controlled trials that were conducted in low income and medium income um, countries. And this included about 4,000 subjects that were included in those 23 trials. Um, some of the studies were high risk of bias, which, which weakens your strength of, of, con um, of confidence in the conclusion. But still, they did look at different probiotic agents in these 23 trials. It included studies with lactobacillus bifidobacterium as well as Saccharomyces probiotics. And interestingly, none of the studies reported any significant treatment-related adverse effects, even though these probiotics are being given to preterm neonates, which you would think would be a fairly susceptible um, population. And interestingly, what they found when they looked at the results, when they pulled together the results of these 23 randomized controlled trials, they found that with the outcomes for ex of late, um, I'm sorry, late onset onset sepsis, on the end point of mortality, and of occurrence or incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis, that in all three cases, they could say that probiotics could be given a, a quality of evidence grade of high for being able to be used as an intervention for prevention of these conditions. And so keep in mind, and, and in some cases you'll hear people say that, well, probiotics may have effects, but the effects aren't, aren't all that large in terms of their magnitude. This particular outcome shows an improvement in the endpoint of mortality, which is about the most important endpoint I think you can get in any study. And so what they showed was, was that these preterm infants clearly had benefit from probiotic intervention in their lives. The next study was a study that was conducted in Botswana. And this study was a pilot trial, so it wasn't that big. I think they, they included about 76 um, subjects. And they had four arms to this particular study. And what they set out to do was to determine whether or not children who were admitted to the hospital with acute diarrhea could, be, could benefit from intervention with lactobacillus ruteri probiotics but also with an intervention of rapid enteric testing to try to determine if their pediatric diarrhea was associated with viruses or with an enteric bacterial pathogen. And if the diarrhea was associated with a bacterial pathogen, they treated with antibiotics. And so the four arms of the study included no intervention, lactobacillus ruteri alone, lactobacillus ruteri in combination with rapid enteric testing, or just the rapid enteric testing. And what they found in this study, and I think that these, this outcome is, is quite remarkable considering um, how few subjects were really included in each arm. But what they found was that the combination of rapid enteric testing to identify whether or not a bacterial pathogen was involved and the lactobacillus ruteri um, not only decreased recurrent diarrhea after at the 60-day um, endpoint, which was how the study was designed. But it also had a positive effect on the age-adjusted height for these, in, these children that were included in the study. So here you have a really important physiological parameter of growth of these children that's positively affected by the probiotic in combination with the, with the rapid enteric testing. So I think that that's a very important um, endpoint as well. And then another, this is the last of the studies that I want to talk about in the more therapeutic component of my talk. And this is a trial that I'm sure many of you have seen. It was conducted in India. And this, if people are going to the PAI meeting tomorrow, the um, lead author on this paper is going to be speaking there tomorrow. Um, and this particular trial looked at whether or not a symbiotic, which is a probiotic combined with a prebiotic, could prevent sepsis among infants in rural, in rural Indian settings. And without going into the, the data, and the t table I know is very small, I will just summarize very briefly what this study did. They incorporated 4,556 healthy infants that were, was recruited into the study. They administered lactobacillus plantarum strain plus um, a small amount of fructo oligosaccharide. And what they found was a significant reduction in the combination of sepsis and death, which was the primary endpoint for how this study was designed. And then they also found a significant reduction for culture positive and culture negative sepsis, as well as a decrease in respiratory tract infections. So this is a, an example of, of an important 
vulnerable population that is susceptible to sepsis and other infections after birth, and they were showing a, a very um, significant improvement in the well-being of these um, infants. So now let's turn our attention to the benefits of probiotics in the generally healthy population. So I've put red boxes around these potential benefits that I think are associated with the generally healthy population. Um, but reasonable people might disagree with whether or not I've, I've um, maybe overstepped the definition of what healthy is, but I'll try to explain my logic. Uh, Starting out with the benefits that are associated with probiotics for infants, treatment of colic is one. So the treatment of colic, you might argue, well, that's a therapeutic effect. But, but my position would be is that these infants are basically healthy infants that, that are having GI distress. And so a food associated or even a supplement that could be used to help alleviate this digestive problem really is an example of, of a healthy child being um, helped by a probiotic. The prevention of atopic dermatitis is another example. Um, the, the studies are a bit mixed on this endpoint, but, but it does show that, that there are, the research does suggest that probiotics administered especially to the mothers during late term and pregnancy if their infant is at high risk of developing allergies, can be protected to some extent of, from the development of atopic dermatitis. Another example that I've considered to be part of, the, um, uh, part of the effects for the general population is managing symptoms of, of functional bowel disorders. And again, there are some people who actually are, of course, are diagnosed with functional bowel disorders that are serious conditions. But there also are quite a few people who go through life with symptoms that really don't reach the level of being diagnosed, and they aren't necessarily even seeking treatment for these symptoms, but they might endure occasional diarrhea, occasional constipation, occasional um, abdominal pain, and those types of endpoints are examples of ones that probiotic may, probiotics may benefit. So I would consider that to be an example where uh, the, that the general population may benefit. I've mentioned this already, managing symptoms of lactose intolerance is a, is a benefit associated with probiotics. Reducing incidence and duration of common infectious diseases, um, especially upper respiratory tract infections and some common GI illnesses. So again, this is a prevention where these studies were conducted on healthy people and the study showed a reduction in these conditions. Prevention of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Now, someone could say, well, healthy people don't really take antibiotics. You have to be diseased. But I know in the United States, for example, over 200 million prescriptions of antibiotics are used every year. And not all of those people are patient populations. There's a lot of ambulatory people who are taking either prophylactic antibiotics or antibiotics for for a condition where they're really quite mobile and still going to work and, and are functioning quite well. And these people are examples of the general population who I think can benefit from probiotics. Probiotics have been shown to help manage blood lipid profiles, primarily look, um, in the area of reducing, uh, in, in a moderate, in a modest way, reducing um, LDL levels and in some cases, total cholesterol levels. And prevention of tra traveler's diarrhea is another example. So now let's look at a few examples of studies um, for these endpoints. So this is another systematic review and meta-analysis that I wanted to share with you that focused on acute upper respiratory tract infections. In this particular systematic review and meta-analysis, what they did is um, in there were 13 randomized controlled trials that met their inclusion criteria, and that included 3,700 children, adults, and elderly. So they included all ages in this particular study. And they found that probiotics were better than placebo in reducing the number of participants that were experiencing episodes of acute upper respiratory tract infection. So in, in essence, they reduced the incidence. They were able to also show that the mean duration of an episode of acute upper respiratory tract infections was reduced. And they also showed that antibiotic use was decreased and that cold-related school absences were decreased. And again, I think these are very important endpoints for the general population and very applicable to um, healthy populations. 
Now, the observations from this particular systematic review led to a group of us who wanted to ask a question, again, using the systematic review and meta-analysis um, approach, to ask the question whether or not there was what the level of evidence supported the idea that probiotic consumption could reduce antibiotic utilization. And what we did is we did a systematic review looking at all the papers that pulled together, or I'm sorry, all the, all the randomized controlled trials that looked at the prevention of common infections and asked whether or not they also tracked antibiotic usage. And in fact, many of them did, and, and the conclusions from this particular meta-analysis, which has just now been submitted to the journal, um, International Journal of Epidemiology, what it showed was that there was moderate quality evidence suggesting that infants and children, so there was no evidence for this in adults, but in infants and children who were given probiotic lactobacillus or bifidobacteria, um, to prevent respiratory tract infections and acute lower GI infections had a decreased risk of being prescribed antibiotics. And I think that that's a really important finding because obviously the use of antibiotics is an important public health consideration or concern. And if something as safe and easy to use as probiotics could potentially have an impact on reducing overall antibiotic use, I think that that could be, a very, impo could be very important even on a public health scale. This is a study that looked at, and again, it was a systematic review and meta-analysis to pull together the evidence that was available on how probiotics affected child growth. And they weren't able to do a meta-analysis. I'm sorry, I misspoke on that. They were only able to do a systematic review because the papers that they found that looked at child growth with probiotic supplementation were done with such heterogeneous endpoints that it wasn't possible to pull the, the data into a single, um, a single summed effect size. But what they were able to do was identify 12 studies that looked at probiotics and tracked child growth. And including 10 randomized controlled trials with a little less than 3,000 children. And what they were uncovered when they did their systematic review was that five of these studies were focused on um, children from developing countries. Now, the subset of studies from, that were conducted in developing countries found positive effects of probiotics on child growth. The, and four of those studies were conducted on undernourished children and one on well-nourished children. So there was no impact on the on studies that were done in um, the not the the um, industrialized or, or um, non or, sorry on developed countries, but the evidence was there for the um, for the effect of probiotics on child growth in developing countries. So. The evidence really did suggest that probiotics have the potential to improve child growth in developing countries and in undernourished children. And again, I think that that's a very important finding from a public health point of view. And, the, and as we know, the growth parameters in young children can have important effects on the physiology of that child as the child ages from both a physiological point of view as well as a cognitive point of view. The next study I want to mention is the one on colic. Um, again, this was a systematic review and meta-analysis. Unlike the other systematic reviews that, that I've covered, this particular meta-analysis was conducted and in only included studies on a single strain. The studies that were included in this meta-analysis were done on lactobacillus ruteri uh, and a specific strain, DSM-17398. And what they found when they looked at the literature base about studies that were conducted um, on colic with this strain, they found four double-blinded um, randomized controlled trials. It included 345 infants. Interestingly, the bulk of the evidence was in breastfed infants. So the conclusions on the benefits of probiotics for colic really can only be extended to breastfed infants right now. There's not enough data on formula-fed infants to be able to make that conclusion. And what they showed was that infant crying and fussing was reduced by about 21 to 25 minutes per day. Um, and the probiotic um, was as likely as placebo to, the, as the placebo group to experience treatment success at weeks one, two, and three during the study. So again, this is evidence that, that 
probiotics can, or this particular strain of probiotic can help a healthy infant. Now, one other area that I'd like to briefly discuss is the idea about, about the ability of probiotics to promote resilience um, within both the microbiota of people as well as the um, physiology or physiological function of, of healthy people. And the graph that I have on the, on the left of this slide um, is showing more or less what I think that people think about in terms of the ability of probiotics to promote, let's say, balance or, or stability of the microbiota. So if you look at the top line, I don't know if the colors are going to show up well on, on what you're seeing, but if you look at the top line, that would, for example, be a stable microbiota that's not being affected at all. If you add a perturbation, there's a couple of things that can happen. If you have the perturbation with no intervention, what you can have is a depression or a disturbance in the microbiota that is sustained for a certain period of time and then eventually recovers. And that's typically what your microbiota does, whether the perturbation is antibiotics or stress or some other drug. That, that's typically what happens. It may not recover fully, but for the most part it does bounce back. What the, the question is, is whether or not a probiotic might be able to either decrease, I'm having trouble with the mouse here, there it is, can either decrease the extent of the perturbation or the disturbance, I'm sorry, so the perturbation occurs, can it decrease the effect the perturbation has, or can it cause a more rapid rebound? And those are two questions that, that I think are very interesting from the point of view of whether or not probiotics can have that impact on the gut microbiota. So the restoration of the gut microbiota um, may actually help prevent microbiota-associated disorders. So the question is, is what kind of evidence do we have for this mechanism? And, and right now, there are a few studies that show that probiotics may help the microbiota recover more quickly, but really there's not a robust body of evidence to really prove this. So I think that this is a very uh, important area for future scientific, um, for future research, and I think very importantly, we have to be able to link any impact on microbiota to clinical benefits. So pulling the bulk of my talk together now, I, I think that probiotics and certainly fermented foods, and I didn't really discuss prebiotics, but they would be included in this as well, may provide a safe approach to the dietary management of many modern health challenges, especially those that are related to microbiota disturbances. Studies of probiotics in healthy people have shown to have a variety of different benefits, including metabolic health measures, immune support, intestinal health, reducing common infections, reducing antibiotic use, and hopefully in the future we'll have evidence that probiotics can support the resilience of a healthy microbiota and help us resist effects of perturbations that we all experience over life. And I'd like to point out that, that even small magnitudes of effect can have a big impact on overall public health. So let's move now to how we make decisions about what probiotics to even consider taking. My basic recommendation is, is that when you choose a probiotic for an intervention, your decision needs to be based on what your health needs are and importantly, what evidence exists that a specific probiotic may have a benefit for the particular need that you're expressing. And of course, remember that strain matters. So as I mentioned, for example, the, the data on colic is only related or is only available for one specific strain of lactobacillus ruteri. And of course, you're also looking for responsible manufacturing and, and a quality product. So there are some considerations for choice of a probiotic, and the bullet points I've listed here come primarily from sort of frequently asked questions about probiotics. First of all, and I covered this already, not all fermented foods are probiotics. So if you're looking specifically for a probiotic, you have to remember that not all fermented foods, just because they may contain live microbes, are necessarily studied adequately to be able to be called a probiotic. Products with many strains are not necessarily better than products with fewer strains or even a single strain. 
people want to think, I think, sometimes that, that more is always better. And there are many studies that have been conducted on single strains of probiotics that have shown benefit. So again, you need to let evidence be your guide. And that similar logic plays out with the concept of probiotics that may deliver higher doses. There are probiotics, and in fact, the lactobacillus ruteri used for colic is an example of one of those, where it's actually administered at 100 million, the, the, the minimum amount of the product is 100 million per day. Well, actually for the colic studies, it was 500 million per day. Um, but there are products out there that'll be sold in the billions and billions, you know, tens of billions, hundreds of billions. So it's not necessarily the total number that matters, but whether or not there's evidence for a benefit. And people often will ask, well, are foods better or are supplements better? And I'm not even going to get into the area of potential probiotic drugs. And I think that what has to guide the decision between a food or a supplement has to do, again, what evidence is there for what product. But then after that, if you have the opportunity to, or the option of, of choosing among a food versus a supplement that both have evidence, then you really need to look at, at what fits in with your particular lifestyle or needs. So if you're traveling and you need something for, to help prevent against traveler's diarrhea, maybe a refrigerated product isn't the best choice for you. But if you're looking for a product that has nutritional value as well as potential benefits that come from the fermentation process uh, that, as the microbes are growing in the product, then maybe a fermented probiotic food is a good choice for you. So it, it, it's, it to some extent, depends. So what, what I typically recommend to people is if you have a particular health concern, you, the best recommendation is to choose a probiotic for that particular problem that's been shown to be beneficial. So do the studies exist? So if you are looking for a probiotic to help you manage antibiotic-associated side effects, there are certain probiotic strains that have been tested and shown to have that benefit. So I think that really has to be primarily what guides you. Now there are a few published guides out there. Um, this particular one was prepared by the World Gastroenterology um, Organization. It's a global guidelines document on probiotics and prebiotics, and it was just recently updated in 2017. And if you look at tables 8 and 9, table 8 is, focuses on adult indications, table 9 focuses on pediatric indications, you will see a compilation of evidence for a particular disorder, what particular probiotic or prebiotic intervention was used, what the dose of the probiotic was, and really nicely in this particular publication, they grade the evidence. They will tell you the strength of the evidence to support the benefit of the probiotic. And, and so these are tables that I, I recommend if you're, if you're looking for particular evidence levels and what's known about particular probiotic strains. In addition to the WGO um, table, there is another guideline. Unfortunately, it's not available in India, but this guide has been developed for both Canada and pro products that are in Canada and products that are in the United States. And so maybe down the road, this can be developed for products that are available in India as well. But I, I do like this particular probiotic guide because what they do is they, again, look at the available evidence on, avail on products that are in the marketplace, and they recognize that the products that are in the marketplace are going to vary based on geographical location. This is available online. It's freely downloadable. What they've done is they've included a variety of endpoints. I'm not going to read all of these off, but from antibiotic-associated di diarrhea all the way through traveler's diarrhea, but interestingly, unlike the WGO guideline that I just previously mentioned, this one will, this particular guide also looks at other non-gut associated benefits. So for example, it does rate evidence on reduction, the ability of a probiotic product to reduce um, LDL and total cholesterol. So it, it's a nice compilation. The other thing they do um, similarly, but not using quite the same process as the WGO guideline, is that they do give evidence grades. So they talk about level one, level two, and level three evidence. And what I would suggest if you were, were interested in looking at this guide is focus on the level one evidence, because that means that there's a ran at least one randomized controlled trial, which is the level evidence that you'd be looking for. 
There also is a guide, and it's not anywhere near as thorough as the other ones that I mentioned, but it, in 2013 that was published by the European Society for Primary Care Gastroenterology. And this was really focused on pro trying to provide recommendations to physicians. And they do a nice job of talking about what probiotic products are available for specifically for functional bowel symptoms. Now one thing to keep in mind about probiotics is that different people may respond differently to a probiotic. People have different diets, they have different colonizing microbiota, they, and each person has his or her own individual characteristics that they bring to bear on how microbes interact with them. And so you can't necessarily expect that all probiotics are going to be effective for all people. There certainly are responders and non-responders, so we, we need to keep that in mind. Now what if you don't have a specific health concern? What if you really are just interested in supplementing your diet or adding live microbes to your diet? And I think if, and, and there are people out there who are generally healthy, don't really have a particular complaint, and just have heard a lot of the buzz about micro, human microbiome and just want to be able to, to have live microbes. Then I think in that case, you certainly can consider probiotics that have been shown to have benefits for healthy people, and certainly consider fermented foods, even if they don't reach the level of probiotics, that you're still providing potentially live microbes to your gut. You can add probiotic foods, prebiotics, and fibers, I think, are all strategies that can support your microbiota. Examples of those, again, the traditional fermented foods in, in India, and of course there are probiotic foods that are available in India as well. I do want to mention another World Gastroenterology Organization diagram that they, that they provided um, years ago, and I just think it's interesting when they talk in general about daily tips to improve digestive health, there on the list under fiber and water is probiotics. And so the WGO certainly recommends just in general the um, consumption of probiotics. If you noticed out on the table outside, there were several infographics that were available that were produced by the um, International Scientific Association of Probiotics and Prebiotics. And I just want to highlight these for you because I think that there's some really nice well-compiled information that, that have been put together by experts in the field that are, are available and I think digestible, if I can use that word, by the lay population or the lay public. First of all, there, there's one on probiotics for healthy people. There's an infographic on fermented foods. There's one on gut microbiota, our microbial partners. Effects of probiotics and prebiotics on the microbiota one that focuses only on prebiotics and one that focuses on probiotics. So all of these are freely available on the ISAP website, www.isapscience.org. And similarly, ISAP has developed a series of videos. These are short videos, about three minutes in length, again designed for um, consumption by the general population. And the topics that are available for those include what is a probiotic, are all probiotics the same, health benefits of probiotics, and how to choose a probiotic. So I think all of those um, could be of interest um, to people wanting to know more about the field. So in summary, I'd like to just capitalize or comment, summarize the key points. First of all, I don't think there's any question that our colonizing microbiota are important to our health. I do think that there are available strategies to help support our gut microbiota, and that includes fibers and prebiotics, but also it includes probiotics as well as fermented foods. Fermented foods may contain live microbes, but just a reminder, they may not have been studied for health benefits, and so not all fermented foods can be considered probiotic foods. Health benefits for probiotics include therapeutic benefits as well as benefits for the generally healthy population. When choosing a probiotic, the simple recommendation is let evidence of health benefit be your guide. Um, some evidence-based guidelines are available, but unfortunately none that I'm aware of that are focused on products available in India. If you're in a situation where an evidence-based product is not available, you may need to resort to trial and error to see if it will help. Remember that individuals respond differently to probiotics, and please look into the ISAP materials if you'd like further information on those. And with that, I will thank you for your attention.